singularity. I'm sitting here today with Willem Hurtling, who is the award-winning author of a singularity trilogy, um, starting with Avogadro Corp, The Singularity is Closer Than It Appears. Then the second book in the series is called AI Apocalypse. And the last one is called The Last Firewall. So let me say uh, thank you very much for being with us today, Will. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Well, perhaps the best way to begin our interview today will be to ask you, um, if you were to introduce yourself in a couple of words, how would you do that? Well, by background, I am a computer programmer. That was my education, and I did that for about eight years at a computer security company first, and then at Hewlett Packard. And then I went into doing web and social media strategy. I did that for about eight years. And during that period of time, I became interested in recommendation engines. So I was starting to learn a little bit about machine learning. And while I was doing that, I happened to read two books back to back that were hugely influential. The first was Ray Kurzweil's The Singularity is Near. And the second was Charles Strauss's Accelerando. And those two books just really changed my thinking about both the future and the world of science fiction. And it ultimately led me to writing this science fiction series, which is all about looking at the future of artificial intelligence at various points in the future. This is so amazing in so many levels, you know, because amazingly, that's exactly what happened to me. I read back to back The Singularity is Near and Accelerando, and those two books blew out my mind so much that I had to start writing the Singularity weblog. And actually, my original website was called Singularity Symposium. Uh, and uh, then once I discovered WordPress, I, I moved into blogging, and then I discovered podcasting, and I started my Singularity one-on-one -on -one series, which is sort of the long story of how I, I ended up talking right. to you here today. But tell me a little bit more about the impact, because obviously we read the same two books, but we ended up doing different things. So I became a blogger and a podcaster, you became a science fiction writer. Why? So I was working with my friend Nathan on a project at the time. We were creating a wish list for Amazon based on recommendation engines. And I had read the two books and I was just raving about AI and how we were going to have strong AI among us soon. And Nathan wasn't buying it at all. And he basically challenged me to come up with what would be a plausible scenario in which we humans who don't really know our, understand our own consciousness, how mm -hmm. could we possibly create a conscious AI? And so we actually had the proverbial paper napkins and I started sketching things out based upon the one area I knew a bunch about, which was recommendation algorithms, and created this idea all over the course of lunch of how you could have recommendation engines optimize language uh, and that language could end up manipulating people because we know this all the time, right? People are social engineered into doing things. And this would be the perfect way for an artificial intelligence to manipulate people. And that becomes the means to affect change in the world. And then the question just becomes motivation. What would be the motivation for an AI to do so? Um, and that's really the subject of my first novel. Well, by the end of lunch, I had Nathan convinced, yes, it was plausible. You could have an AI. It might not be conscious, but it would certainly be able to manipulate the world around it. And I left lunch thinking that this would make a great story. And I also felt like, after reading Accelerando, I felt like there was a big gap in science fiction. Because there were all these books set in the far off future when we have faster than light travel and spaceships and, you know, all these amazing things that really don't make AI an intrinsic part of the story or explain why they're not present. Because once you realize that the singularity is there, you have to either explain why it's not going to happen or, or make it part of the story. Mm -hmm. And traditional, most traditional science fiction stories skip over it. So that made me, when I had the idea for a book, I was like, oh, it's really on me to go fill that gap. Well, that, that's, uh, there's so many interesting elements that I want to grab from the last thing that you said. But let me try and throw a, a, you know, a big branch in your spokes here by saying that I actually interviewed Charlie Strauss. And I was shocked to find out that he's an absolute singularity skeptic. Uh, I mean, how could the, the guy who wrote Acceleran to be such a skeptic? And the gist of his argument at the end of the interview was this. The world is complicated and very complex. Simple, elegant ideas that explain everything are wrong, he, he told right. me. So what, what would you say to something like that? 
Well, so it reminds me of a story from when I was in grad school. So I was attending the University of Arizona getting my master's degree in computer science. And this would have been in 93, 94. And a big problem of the time was how would we send video over the network in real time? And it was a super challenging problem because the network speeds weren't quite up to it. We either had to compress the video or only send parts of it. But at the same point in time, we didn't have the computational power to do it. And so we were working on all these software optimizations, improvements to the TCP protocol, compression of the video, and it always seemed like video on demand was just around the corner. Every year they said, well, it'll be next year we'll have it. It'll be next year we have it. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I happened to have been keeping a spreadsheet of every computer that I had ever owned. So this was just my personal computers. Wow. And every spreadsheet had how fast was the computer, what modem speed did it have, how much memory did it have, how much uh, hard drive space did it have. Okay. And I extrapolated these things out um, year by year to 2030. And I said, I'm tired of hearing that we're, video on demand is around the corner. When would it realistically be plausible for us to send video at sort of native network speeds? Mm -hmm. And the answer that, according to the spreadsheet, was around 2005, 2004, 2005, 2006. Before that, it would have taken some kind of massive software breakthrough to be able yep. to achieve it. And that was it. I kind of put the spreadsheet away, told my friend Gene about it, and he kind of laughed at me. And then a number of years later, Napster came out in 1999. And it occurred to me, it hadn't occurred to me up until that point, but it occurred to me to go back to the spreadsheet and say, when did the spreadsheet suggest we would have had audio on demand? And the sure enough, the spreadsheet said, oh, it'll be sometime between 1999 and 2000. Yeah. And that was when Napster came out. Now, you know, Napster is not a huge technological breakthrough. But what it said to me was the principle behind this is there are trends that are better predicted by the underlying hardware than by the software. Because although there's lots of problems to be solved in software, once the hardware is available, it's so much easier to solve them, and there's so many more people that could work on it. And of course, in 2005 was when YouTube came out. Mm -hmm. And could YouTube have come out before that? Probably not, just because the hardware, the network speeds weren't there and the yeah. hardware wasn't there. In my interview with Ray Kurzweil, who is, as we know, the father of exponential projections, uh, he says invention is all about timing basically right. you don't invade, invent for the world that you live in but you invent for the world that you would live in when your invention is complete right or ready to go to market so you imagine you project forward and you work for that kind of world that was his thing but let me ask you this then because it seems that you're very much the kind of the brute force um, hardware related argument that you sure. just put forward so the question then is yes computational power may be necessary but is it sufficient for a singularity in other words um, Werner Vinge for example says that sometimes we have a software issue and we cannot translate the gains in hardware into software simply because the software programming doesn't keep up with the hardware what do you think about that so look at IBM's Watson, which seems like a big breakthrough for its time. Yes. Bill co coming out of a research lab. Yes. And why is that? Well, because Watson ran on something like two and a half million dollars in hardware. Well, in the early 2020s, that same two and a half million dollars in hardware will be available to the general hobbyist for what they'll buy a desktop computer for in that day. So someone will go out and they'll spend a grand and they'll have essentially the same hardware power that those IBM researchers had. And what that means is instead of AI being something that's restricted to a bunch of guys in a research lab, it means that we will now have millions of hobbyists tinkering with this, mm -hmm. in, you know, in their homes. So which is going to make more progress, you know, 20 smart guys in a lab? or a million people tinkering with it. I mean, they're both necessary, but I think we're gonna see an increase in progress in the same way that we've seen an increase in progress um, with uh, the release of ROS, the robotic operating system, which by being freely available has made it so that robotics researchers don't need to start over from scratch every time they're working on a new robot. Let me stop you there for a second though, because I've been very fortunate to interview both Noam Chomsky and Marvin Minsky. 
And the most uh, surprising thing out of both of those interviews, especially with respect to Professor uh, Minsky, was that both of them, in different ways, and maybe for a little, a li well, actually for mostly the same reasons, denied outright that we have made any gains whatsoever with respect to artificial intelligence for the past three or maybe even four decades. Noam Chomsky was absolutely unimpressed by Watson. Uh, Professor Minsky right. was not very interview. impressed himself. Uh, and basically, it's brute force. In a way, it's, it's, it's um, according to them, it doesn't fit properly into the sort of general AI uh, smart, real properly called artificial intelligence. Uh, and Noam Chomsky has been advocating brute force approach since the 1960s as pretty much the only viable approach. Right. But he said, just like he said uh, with respect to Deep Blue defeating Gary Kasparov, that that was as interesting as a bulldozer winning the Olympics in weightlifting. In other words, yes, machines are very good at brute force, but that is all they would ever be good for. Or, and we have so far no overarching theory, which is, by the way, exactly what Professor Minsky said, that can give us those insights necessary to make the gap from brute force to real intelligence that can properly be called general artificial intelligence. Two extremely smart people, it's hard to argue against them. The counter argument that I can make, um, probably not being as educated in the field as they are, is that we made no progress in the theory of human-powered flight for hundreds of years, although people wanted to fly, it wasn't until there was a motor powerful en enough to pull the airplane into the air that it became possible to really work hard on the problem of flight. Mm -hmm. And similarly, to think that we could have made any real inroads in the 1960s or 70s or 80s into the field of AI when we know that we're so many orders of magnitude far away from the computational power necessary, um, it's just, it seems impossible, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for that reason, just, yes, we don't have the theory, but, you know, we didn't have a theory of YouTube, we didn't have a theory of Napster. I know they're a different class of problems, but I, I would be more concerned if we didn't have a theory when we got to the 2030s. Um, by then, I think we'll start to have these theories. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I actually really like uh, the example that you just picked uh, with, with Flight and the Wright brothers, and I, and I really appreciate it, and I can see how that makes sense. But let me move on a little bit beyond the sort of general theoretical principles of the singularity and, and talk a little bit about your books. But before that, I want to bridge the gap between the two of those by asking you about your specific definition of the singularity. Let's be clear about what we're referring to, because one of the things that I found out after 130 interviews is that many experts have either slightly different or sometimes very different definitions right. of what they're referring to when they call, uh, when they talk about the technological singularity. So what is your definition? For me, the definition is the moment at which we have an artificial intelligence of approximate human level. And th that is, I think, different than the point at which we can't really understand the future, which I know to be the other sort of working definition. We can't see beyond that point because they'll be accelerating That's past the us. event horizon. The hypothesis. event horizon. Yeah. But, you know, those two things probably aren't that far apart. If we had a world of Albert Einsteins, it would be very hard to s catch up with them and see where they were going. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that the moment where we have a computer as smart as people, knowing that that, uh, you know, will exponentially increase year over year means that that and we're just a few years away from that point of accelerating beyond what we can understand. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this then. W one of the subtitles of your um, novels is actually called The Singularity is Closer Than It Appears. So does that mean that you're totally sold on the idea and you think that the singularity is not only going to happen, but it's actually going to happen closer than most of us think it will? Um, I do think it's actually going to happen. And I um, have sort of a little matrix. I have a three by three matrix, uh, which is starting with some of the um, more uh, aggressive examples of how complex we think the human brain is um, to the most conservative ones. Uh, and then how many computers do we do it on? 
Do we do it on what a single individual can do, a small research lab, or a um, you know the world of computers? And so what I've come up with from that is we could have anything from 2015, which is basically right now, if we mm -hmm. had you know all of Google's computers dedicated to it. Your first book starts at 2015. 2015, exactly, um, up to 2045. Mm -hmm. At the worst case scenario, when you know the computers that you're carrying around on your person should be able to simulate a human brain. So I think it'll definitely happen, and it'll happen somewhere in that range. And, you know, I know that, for example, Daniel Wilson, uh, author of Robopocalypse, he argues that there's not a lot of motivation for people to invest in strong AI, that there's Absolutely. better places, better investments to make. But that's there... what Marvin Minsky said, by the way, in my okay. interview with him. And I think that's All true. All the funding is for narrow AI. It's not sure. for general AI. And I think that's true as long as we're talking about businesses hobbyists will create these things because people want to interact with data from Star Trek Enterprise. People want to create their friends, right? There's, I think we're going to see far more by hobbyists in this space than we'll see from businesses at so, first. So you think that the singularity can be open sourced in a way and come from, from some garage? I think it has, to, it, will, it, have, it has to be open lab? source. It has to be open source. I, I, I totally hope you're right, but <laughs> honestly, do you think that the hobbyist in a garage can beat a multi-billion dollar artificial intelligence military lab or a DARPA project? Good question. Um, why is DARPA going to research labs to have you know their contests for driving and their contests for fighting off virus attacks? Right. It's it's not really something that can be centrally mandated. Right? You need the creativity of a lot of different teams working on it. You do need the creativity, but they set the parameters for the research. And then it will be obviously military AI, which is going to be, have very different implications altogether from an open source AI that comes in somebody's garage. Yes, but at the same point in time, you know, I compare it to like the Netflix prize, right? With the Netflix prize competition, what happens is that you had a thousand teams developing stuff one team won but you know 999 other teams went out and said i didn't win what can i do with my knowledge and recommendation algorithms and now mm -hmm. you have people going and finding other business applications for that mm -hmm. so there will be people competing in ai contests and they'll be doing other stuff with that knowledge so let me ask you this then let's assume that everything that you say is correct now Werner vinji says that we would have probably one out of two scenarios, hard takeoff or soft takeoff. Which one do you think is the more likely scenario? What's his definitions of hard takeoff and soft takeoff? Well, hard takeoff is when the singularity happens in a, in a matter of minutes or, or even seconds or, or yeah. hours at the most. So in other words, you have the human level artificial intelligence and then it goes exponential in such a short period of time that within minutes or hours it's already billion times smarter than right. a human and then within a day it's like smarter than all of humanity put together you know in other words the moment of birth to the moment of where we're overwhelmingly the the, the stupid species on this planet is very short period of time now soft takeoff is the 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 version of the singularity where this T happens over years and in other words the the process the the, the change is much more gradual and, and I so I would say that a soft takeoff um, for the reason you know although I'll say my second novel would be more of a hard takeoff absolutely um, approach so it's hard to know but I, I think we're going to have a sense of it yeah I, I had a friend come and say look they're done some research they're simulating um, they're trying to simulate a cat brain so does this mean we're going to see virtual cats walking among us in robotic form or something else? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I quickly go and check the stats on cat brains versus human brains, and it's like seven years apart uh, in terms of when we can simulate a cat brain in hardware versus when we can simulate a human brain in hardware according to the relative complexity. So I think we're going to know. I think we're going to see almost human-like intelligence, and we're going to see that coming. And, you know, we won't have that rapid takeoff. Now, at some point in time, yeah, I think you could have a, a quick acceleration, but I don't think it will hit us um, from out of the blue. Uh, going back to your two examples about whole brain simulation, be it uh, one of a cat or a human being, 
the interesting another interesting thing that shocked me during the Marvin Minsky interview is that not only does he think that this is going in the wrong direction uh, I mean uh, Dr. Henry Makram most recently got a billion dollars from the European Union for a 10 year old uh, you know human brain project right. but he actually thinks that this is actually taking money away from potentially good projects and it could uh, take us to what he calls an AI nuclear winter because it's a lot of money spent in the wrong direction and taking money from people who create the important stuff like theory in his opinion right. and therefore it could have not only uh, uh, it could have overall just horrible effects on the whole f progress of AI and the thing I would come back to then is sort of the ever decreasing cost of doing AI I remember how difficult DNA sequencing was when they started and how long it would take to sequence the human genome and now for $99, right, you can go have, you know, get a comprehensive DNA profile. So, you know, I think the answer is, is the cost will just decrease. And so even if right now this is stealing some money, 10 years from now it's going to be much cheaper to do the research. And 10 years after that, it'll be ridiculously cheap to do the research. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where, you know, the exponential growth of hardware power and the diminishing cost thereof actually very much supports your, your argument. So, Will, let me ask you this. You have three singularity novels. Is it fair to say that, and one of them in the subtext says that the singularity is closer than you can imagine. Is it fair to claim that your overarching message is that message between the three books and now you gave us the context of how the, the idea for the first book ar right. arose out of an argument of whether the singularity is likely to happen or not so is it closer than we know i mean i think it's a range and i think it's something we should be thinking about because for at least for people of my age you know i believe it will happen in my lifetime it will certainly happen in my kids lifetime and i think we need to be thinking about it then we if we have strong AI, how will we guide them so that they're behaving in a way that's acceptable to us? Um, will we have moral behavior? Will we, you know, I, it, it seems implausible that we would have a Terminator-like scenario in which we're all killed off. I hope not. I'm an optimistic. But at the same point in time, there's still a lot of room for the damage that could be done. And so it's something we need to be thinking about, right? We should ideally have figured out the moral aspects of this and figure out how to safeguard AI behavior before we've actually created the AI. Yeah. And so it's, it's certainly not too soon to start thinking about that and being doing as much research in that space as we are in creating the thinking machines. Mm -hmm. Let me try and get you on that claim that it's implausible because uh, you, you see, I mean, I, I've interviewed a lot of um, AI experts and a lot of science fiction authors and and I think there's almost an even split o on that idea and I mean there's a whole uh, the Singularity Institute which is now uh, called Machine MIRI Machine Intelligence right. Research Institute has devoted its sole, sole purpose of existence is to improve our chances of survival which they deem to be very low overall in the context of the creation of artificial intelligence. I recently interviewed uh, James Barrett who wrote a book which is perhaps the best collection in my view of the negative implication of a technological singularity called Our Final Invention. So please tell me more about why do you think that the Terminator scenario, the end of the world, the, I mean one of your books is called AI Apocalypse. Why do you think that's not, not plausible? I, I, well, I think that that particular form of conflict isn't the way that it will take. So look at what's happening right now with trading software, stock trading software, right? It is behaving in ways it is, you know, manipulating the market in order to create margins for itself to further exploit the market. Uh, and it could completely crash the global economy. Absolutely. And that's not a general purpose AI, and that's not a robot that's physically taking advantage of us. Um, and in fact, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? But the Terminator scenario is really not so much about the intelligence of the machine as it is about the strength of the machine, that they're more resilient to damage. And in fact, in most of those scenarios, it's about um, the sort of the physical invulnerability of the machine versus in the end, human ingenuity. And I think that that's a very deceptive 
way to look at the problem because the problem is not going to be about you know silver robots with laser guns fighting us it's going to be about very smart ai doing things that may or may not cause us to be able to unable live be unable to live on the planet let me get you right there on being deceptive and silver robots with 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 guns against us i mean ai apocalypse right right which uh I found lots of parallels with Daniel Wilson's uh, Robopocalypse. And, and just like I asked him, I want to ask you, after all that you just told me about that being an implausible argument, is there no some, not some kind of a friction of you writing a book with the exact opposite scenario where AI actually does come in robot form right. and do have weapons and, and do start killing us? So yes, it's, the risk is obviously there, and that's the reason why I write about it. And I actually have a fan in Panama who wrote to me and said, why do the humans win in your novels? <laughs> and I said, well, it's a good question, because when I'm writing them, it does seem like the machines have all the advantages. And yeah. it's actually always a stretch to figure out how will I make the humans win this time around, when the machines seem to hold all the cards, the intelligence, the weapons, everything. Um, but... You know, I'm an optimist, and I grew up in an age of optimistic science fiction, and that's what I want to write. So that's what I write, and, and that's my viewpoint on AI is still optimism. You know, I would like to live in the world of Star Trek The Next Generation, and the best way to get there is going to be by having friendly AI that will help us get to this age where we can explore space and things like that. And um, so I'm still an optimistic, but I think there's a lot of risks. I just think that the risks are more likely to be in things like crashing the global economic system or in um, in the process of taking over computers, rendering them useless to us so that our global supply chains fail and we die because we're starving in cities. I think that those scenarios are just more likely than the scenarios of us being attacked by robots with guns. Let me give you an alternative conflict scenario, which is very popular uh, in some circles. It's the Artilect War scenario. I've interviewed Dr. Hugo de Garris for my show, and he said he didn't think that the actual war, what he calls the Giga War, would be one between machines and humans. He thinks it will be between two groups of humans that he calls the Cosmists and the Terrans. That is, the people, the Cosmists are the people who are pro um, machine intelligence, pro human enhancements. Uh, and people who would be conservative or who would, for religious or other reasons, decide to oppose the other group. Right. In other words, he thinks that the next world war, the third world war, the Giga War, the Artilect War, would be between two groups of human pro and against uh, the singularity. How about that for a likelihood scenario of global conflict? Yeah, I think it's likely. Um, it's similar to the topic that I'm working on for my next novel. So, uh, you know, I do want to explore that scenario. Very interesting. Um, it is very interesting. And obviously, nearer term even than that is the use of drones in warfare and the automation that we have there. Already and, a fact. Which is already a fact. And there, uh, obviously, drones can and will be used to kill people. Um, and we expect that. We might not approve of it, but that's what we expect military drones to do. The other danger, obviously, is that the drones kill people that we don't want them to kill. Um, and there, the biggest danger is that machines often aren't smart enough. Um, and, and so they'll kill the wrong people because they're not smart enough. And a great example of this, so my friend Chris Robson is a Buddhist mathematician, a uh, phenomenal guy to talk to. And he always gives this example. If you're walking down a street late at night, and you see a bunch of sort of scary looking people in front of you, uh, you never say to myself, oh my God, I hope they're not too smart. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you hope that they're a bunch of smart people because the smart people are less likely to hurt you. And um, so his point of view is, in fact, the most dangerous point is before the AI is smart enough. Um, because once the AI is smart enough, it will choose not to harm us. But when it's not intelligent enough to make those decisions, it will kill indiscriminately. And in the case of military drones, we could easily imagine a case of a drone going crazy and killing everybody. Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting and, and almost unique argument. It's very similar to what Robert J. Sawyer argues in his trilogy, WWW, yes. which is about emergent artificial intelligence. 
So let, let me ask you this then. Do you think that overall chances are that the singularity will be a positive or a negative thing for humanity? I think it is will be positive. Um, you know, the opportunities that we have are basically to, you know, resolve death in some way, to either upload into a computer or fix our human body so that we can live forever. We have the opportunity for advancing technologically faster than we ever have before, allowing us to do really anything we want. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of potential. Uh, I think that there's some risk, but I'm still optimistic. Mm -hmm. And you kind of connected very well with my consequent question about where does transhumanism and immortality fit into the whole picture and how? That's a good question. Um, one of the other things that I've looked at with projecting technology is when will we realistically have computers in our brains? Because I think that's probably one of the first big transhumanistic things we'll experience. And the odds are that we'll have that around 2035. I was actually a little surprised to see that that would be much earlier than sort of the worst case predictions for AI. So we may have computers in our brains long before we have AI uh, around us. And that's really interesting. We will be augmenting our own intelligence. And by the, it's possible by the time that we have AI, we will be as much artificial as the AI are. Oh, so, so you think that actually perhaps that could be one point of mitigation? of the conflict because we would be a lot more like them by the time they're a lot more like us. Exactly. Ah, that's that's a very, very interesting, very interesting idea. I, I like it. I, I like <laughs> it a lot, I have to say. But what about immortality? Where does that fit into the whole picture? When we become a lot more like them, does that mean we'll be able to completely overcome biology? And I mean, death is the biggest limiter of right. all. I feel like we have not really made a lot of progress um, in really extending the human lifespan. We've resolved a lot of issues that can cut the human lifespan short, uh -huh. but we haven't really resolved at the end. On the extent, right? yeah. Uh, and so I feel, a little, you know, perhaps not as optimistic about that, um, but I do think that for example, a human brain upload, to me, seems far more feasible. So I may not be able to keep my flesh body alive indefinitely. But if I can go on and live virtually, um, I would consider that a fine outcome. Very interesting, because based on my own personal research and conversations with a number of people like Aubrey de Grey and Rando Kuhne, uh, one of which uh, had the quest for basically indefinite life extension, and the other one who uh, basically spearheads the uh, whole brain emulation, uh, I think that actually Aubrey de Grey may be a lot further ahead than Rando Kuna is. And it seems to me that whole brain emulation, let alone mind uploading, would be much tougher, it seems to me, than, uh, say, um, removing the biological junk that accumulates in our cells right. and that eventually ends up causing, you know, uh, old age related uh, diseases like Alzheimer's, uh, etc., and eventually cancer, and, or, or uh, that lead to death. Don't you find that to be more plausible that we would actually figure out the mechanisms inside of the cells before we actually get to do the whole brain upload, whole mind upload? Honestly, I don't know enough about the biological side to feel like I can speak to that aspect of it. The reason I think the human brain upload is plausible is because it is the similar sorts of things that it will be required to have a human equivalent AI. And if we enter the realm of having the AI, even if we can't solve the problems, the AI will. So that's why I feel sort of more optimistic about that aspect of it. Well, for me, one of the recent revelations uh, on that topic came during my interview with uh, Dr. Stuart Hameroff at the University of Arizona when he said that to call a neuron uh, a simple classical computer it's the greatest insult to the neuron because there's a lot more going on in a neuron than a simple uh, zero or one kind of a straightforward classical computer computation sure. so how is that going to be resolved but how are you going to translate something which is not translatable according to him in zeros and ones 
Well, that's, you know, to say that it's not translatable in zeros and ones, at some level, some underlying behavior is. And so even if we're in a situation where it's two orders of magnitude more complex than we thought, well, that's just extending out the singularity 10 years. If it's four orders of magnitude more complex, it's 20 years. So it doesn't, I think, reduce the inevitability of it. It just moves it further out. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, let, me, let me ask you a little bit more about death and immortality. Um, you haven't touched directly transhumanism as an issue in any of your novels. Why is that? Are you avoiding it deliberately? Well, so in my third novel, um, I start to talk about it a lot more. Most of the characters have neural implants. Um, they use them primarily to interact with the network, not as much to modify themselves. Um, but by the end of the book, mm -hmm. we have characters who are really able to change, affect the world around them with their implants. Um, we have a character who's basically been rebuilt from scratch, and he has a human brain but a robotic body. Um, and so I started exploring it much more during the course of the novel. And, you know, the series of books is set at 10-year intervals. So Avogadro Corp is set in approximately 2015, AI Apocalypse in 2025, and The Last Firewall in 2035. And my next book will be set in 2045, where it pretty much becomes inevitable to address transhumanism. So it is something I'm growing into mm -hmm. as I write. So what's your take on transhumanism? Is it a good thing or a bad thing in your view? Let's start perhaps. What is transhumanism first? Well, to me, transhumanism is modification of our basic human type, extending ourselves with technology or with genetic engineering so that we're somehow better than we were as humans before that point in time. And we do that all the time now, right? We carry a smartphone and that is technology that extends how we can interact. And all we're really doing is bringing the technology in closer. So I think it's inevitable. I mean, some people are sort of horrified by the idea, but you know, when the day comes that neural implants are available, I guarantee there will be a substantial part of the population that will say, sign me up. I'm tired of looking at these screens or I'm tired of, you know, interacting with this computer as this separate thing. I want it part of me. Would you sign and up? I would definitely sign up. I, well, I won't sign up for version 1.0, yeah. but I'll sign up. <laughs> um, and especially as people get older, I mean, I've reached the point where, you know, now I'm trying to find the right distance to hold the things to look at. And it becomes a problem. And as we get older, it's, ob it's an obvious solution to that problem. Now, if I can get information in and out of me and it doesn't require vision and it doesn't require those things, it's going to be a great enabler for either people that are older or people that are disabled in some way. Um, and so between the early adopters and the people who need it, there will be at least two big sort of fan bases for that kind of technology. Yeah, I, I can totally sympathize with that because even though I consider myself early adopter in technology, when it comes to biotech and connecting stuff to my neuro, uh, you know, uh, neurocortex, I'd be one of the most cowardly <laughs> adopters, uh, the last that will go on the market probably because if we get it wrong, if I get it wrong, you know, it's one thing to get a virus on my computer and have to reformat the hard drive. Right. This happens with, with my brain, not... not. <laughs> and, and that might make sense for adopting the technology early. But if the time came where it was a choice of, well, we can give you the implant or you'll die within three months. Yeah, now, the impetus, the equation is completely changed. So right. I can see how people in that context would be definitely the first ones to jump on the bandwagon. So let me ask you this then. Would it be fair to say that you're both a singularitarian and a transhumanist? I would say I'm primarily a, uh, a singularity guy. The, the other part I see more is the outcome, uh, as sort of a secondary outcome. I think we have to solve all the problems with AI. We have to both get there and we have to ensure their moral behavior. And I think a large part of what we'll see in transhumanism will come after that point. Uh, well, let me ask you, uh, is there any 
movie rights or film rights on the horizon or have you done anything on that end well, could we could we expect uh, like a full movie production on one of your books <laughs> uh, I certainly hope so so no movie rights yet um, uh, I'm trying to shop the book around and get some interest mm -hmm. and see what happens because there's actually a lot of interest in the topic lately I mean your friend Daniel Wilson's book rights for Robocalypse were picked up by Steven Spielberg yep and I think uh, it was originally scheduled for 2014 now it's going to be 2015 that we should be expecting a book by Spielberg nonetheless yeah, absolutely which would be very interesting <coughs> so well let me ask you um, two questions which are basically both sides of, of the same coin first of all what is your greatest inspiration the greatest dream the thing that absolutely blows your mind when you project as much forward into the future as possible and then the flip side of that coin is what's your greatest fear what's the thing that scares you the most my greatest aspiration it would be that we we are able to create a smarter than human AI uh, and that we have a friendly relationship with them in which they take a benevolent point of view to us and they're here to help us on a mission to basically become more fulfilled human beings. Um, and Isn't whether, that very self-serving to us though? I mean, wouldn't they have more interesting things to do? I, I think that's a possibility. Um, but on the other hand, you know, at least at the current point in time, right, we're all part of one ecosystem. And uh, just like ants are part of our ecosystem, but we're not very interested in making their life better, perhaps. We're not, but it also prevents us from, say, wiping them out entirely because they exist in our ecosystem. And yeah, but we yeah. don't hesitate if we trample on their anthill every once that, in a while. That's, that's true. Well, maybe think of us as then as pet dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not so likely to kill our pet dogs. Um, I, no, I mean, I think it, so at the one at one end of the spectrum, right, is sort of total human fulfillment um, so that we're resolved of all the issues that we have today on this planet, of which there are many. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, we really are just ants to the AI or, or worse yet, um, we're just standing in the way of the resources that they want. Right. If they want to turn the entire world into one big computational substrate we won't have a role in that. Um, so that would be the worst case scenario. So you do fear, at least a little bit, even though you're overall an optimist, that the AI apocalypse may indeed have some probability of coming to be. It's there. It's a little it, fear. It's an option, yes. Yes. So um, Ray Kurzweil, uh, in his uh, Stages of the Singularity, says that perhaps the ultimate point of development in the singularity will be w the moment when, quote, the universe wakes up. And, you know, perhaps at that point, our planet will be a giant computronium. There will be no dumb matter across the universe. Everything will be smart matter. Uh, do you have an equivalent uh, of, of that kind of ultimate end or ultimate teleological point of development of the technological singularity? What would be the cosmological implications, in other words, right. of a singularity? You know, I grew up um, at an age where I was watching Carl Sagan on Cosmos. And so for me, the ultimate thing would always be space travel, that we get to explore the universe. Um, so what I really hope happens is that through a combination of both life extension and radical um, acceleration of technology, we do get to a point where people of my generation, if we choose to, could go explore the rest of the universe and find other intelligent species. I mean, what would be more amazing than that? So uh, let me let me uh, bring our conversation to an end with with the last few questions that I traditionally ask. Um, where can people find more about you and your work? What's the best place? The best place is visit my website at williamhertling.com. And there's links to my books there, which can be found on Amazon and Audible.com and Kobo and pretty much all online bookstores. And what's next for Will? We already know that there's a fourth book coming in the series that will be situated in 2045. What else? Are, is there another project or...? So, <clears throat> so the fourth book is... I've just started it uh, on the train ride up here and I'm excited to work on that. 
Beyond that, I think it's actually pretty hard to push out beyond that point in time because you are running into the event horizon. Mm -hmm. So I think I want to come back and tell some more near time, near term stories. Uh, one of the things that I really love is I love data mining. Um, oh, yeah. And uh, that's something I do in my day job. And so I would love to tell a story about, you know, someone who profiles people on Facebook or something like that, because I think there's a lot of really interesting things that happen with data mining that people really aren't aware of. And that's one of the reasons I like to write is just that it gets people thinking about these ideas that they may not have been exposed to before. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a fascinating conversation with you today. So let me ask you, if our audience were to take a single message, the, perhaps the most important thing that you would like them to take away from our conversation today, what would you like that to be? I would, I would like more people to be aware of the ideas of the singularity and accelerating technology, uh, because while I think there's a passion, there's a core group that's very passionate about it, I think most of the population is completely unaware of it, even though these issues will affect us in our lifetime. And people need to start to build up a familiarity with it um, so that, you know, you may have somebody who's never thought about the singularity, but they're in a position to influence people who are working on related technology. They should be able to have that conversation and talk about it. So that would be my hope. Will Hurtling, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me.